In Jesus Christ, our Lord has spoken a word of love into this world. Let us now worship in that love and joy. This is a service for uh, the first Sunday in September. I hope it is a blessing to you. Let's now stop, gather our hearts and minds, and worship God together in song. praise you, triune God. We praise you, Father, for creating us, for speaking the word, let there be light, for making everything from that moment, for your continued creation and renewal of your creation. We praise you. We praise you, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, our Savior, our Rescuer, we praise you for coming to this world, being God's living word among us, and for naming us your brothers and sisters. We praise you, Holy Spirit, who comes to live within us, who connects us with our Lord, uh, who transforms us with power. We praise you, Spirit of life and truth and wisdom. Come, O Lord God, and help us to worship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, by the words we share here today and by your, the power of your love, will you join us with one another and join us with you? Because you are good, you are wonderful, and you have named us your children. You've called us. Help us to accept that identity without fear uh, and live it out. Lord, we know we've done wrong in the things we've done and left undone, in the cruel words we've said and the kind words we fail to say, we have sinned. And that grieves your heart and it does damage to the world around us. We are sorry and ask for your forgiveness and the transforming power of your spirit to be in our lives once more. Thank you, God, that you are a God of mercy and you love us always. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And now together, we pray the prayer that he taught, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from James chapter 3, starting at verse 1. In the first two chapters, James has been uh, giving instructions on living out our faith, and now he uh, continues that, talking about the way we speak. Let's listen for God speaking to us through his holy word. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. 
and a small rudder makes a huge ship turn whenever the pilot chooses to, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, and the tongue is a flame of fire. It's a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who've been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth? Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there's selfish ambition in your hearts, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfish ambition are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there's jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It's also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Come Holy Spirit. And through the words that we've just read, may we draw closer to God. Come Holy Spirit, and through my preaching, will you speak truth and love. Come Holy Spirit, and draw us all close to Jesus. In his name, amen. You know that moment when you've uh, blurted something out and just wish like anything that you could take it back? You tell the joke that it's not funny, and you see the hurt from another person's eyes. You tell a secret or break a trust or make the, the little um, cutting comment to put someone down. And then uh, once it's out of your mouth, you know the damage it's going to do, and you, you can't take it back. That's one of the more... Um, painful moments in our lives. Uh, and sometimes we, uh, you know, live with a lot of regret. Uh, sometimes people, you know, rather than admit they've made a mistake, just charge ahead and make it worse. Uh, but all of us have said words that did damage. Words are powerful. And in this third chapter of James's letter, um, because he's James, once again, he pulls no punches and uses very dramatic language uh, for the effect that our words can have. Um, it's like a little bit that can lead a huge horse or the rudder that can guide a massive uh, sailing ship. And then he uses sort of overly dramatic language to illustrate his point. He's not trying to speak literally. He's trying to come across, to bring across how important this is that you know, no one can control their tongue. No one can um, speak the way they should. If they could, they'd be perfect. Um, but no one can manage it. Uh, in fact, the tongue is a fire lit by hell itself. Whew. In fact, uh, this chapter 
is why uh, some orders of monks throughout uh, history have taken vows of silence, right? Okay, if this is what the Bible says about the danger of our tongue of speaking, then I won't say anything. But the chapter isn't actually a negative one. James pours on this language about the danger, the, the huge you know, conflagration, inferno, that a few unkind words can create. He brings that up to point out how powerful and positive an impact our words can have. They can be seeds of peace that grow into a harvest of righteousness, is how he ends the chapter. Our words can be a spark that starts a forest fire, or it can be a seed that grows into something beautiful. And it depends on what we say and how we say it. But more than that, it depends on where it comes from. This is a chapter about wisdom as much as it's a chapter about speech. And wisdom is knowing God's path for our lives and walking on it. It's a, it's a holistic thing. It's not being smart about one area. It's not you know, memorizing the Bible. It's letting God's way be our way. Accepting God's guidance for our lives. And um, I've read the Bible many times. Uh, I've you know, read through the book of James many times. It has never, until preparing for this sermon, struck me so much the way that James connects wisdom and gentleness. Wisdom is pure, it's unmixed. We've been talking about that a lot through the book so far. It's um, peace-loving, it's gentle. And it got me thinking about the way that we speak these days. We are living in an age of increasing fear and uh, decreasing patience with people that we disagree with. And the, the sort of um, main verbal way we talk today, the, the big cultural um, speech of our day is the sound bite, right? A little clip from a politician, often without context, to either make them look like an idiot or look heroic. Um, the same little clip will be played over and over and over. Um, and in written form, uh, I think the, the defining way we speak to each other is through the tweet uh, a little pithy remark, sometimes a joke, but so often cutting. Our communication these days has more and more of an edge to it, and that's not seen as a bad thing, that's seen as a virtue, right? The other side has to be cut down. They're dangerous, they're wrong, and you use your words to promote your side, to build it up. And along comes James after 2,000 years and says the, the wisdom that comes from God is gentle. Knowing God's path means gentle speech. Walking God's path means gentle speech. To listen first. And when we do speak, to do so with kindness and humility. Uh, humility is another really important word uh, because as he starts the chapter with, uh, we all make many mistakes. Um, he, well, he actually begins this chapter with, not many of you should become teachers, which uh, it is a coincidence, or is it, that uh, I'm preaching on this the first Saturday, the first Sunday in September, um, 
<laughs> not, a, not an easy weekend for teachers, I know, um, but not many of you should be teachers in the church. But that's the beginning. That's not a, a diss against teachers. Um, it's the beginning of him talking about where our words come from. And he contrasts uh, jealousy and selfish ambition with the wisdom of God that is pure and gentle. And a teacher in the ancient world, hopefully still now, uh, is a position of respect, right? And um, the, the way we talk about ministers sometimes is they run a church, we use corporate language. Uh, and in the corporate world, you start at the bottom at an entry level. Maybe if you have an education, if you're smarter, you can start higher up and you work your way up. You get promoted until you're the boss. And so often we think that our life in God should work the same way, right? We start low and build ourselves up. Careful, says James. Building yourself up just sets yourself up for more judgment. All of us make many mistakes, he says. And so be humble. Be aware that in anything you say, anything we say, I definitely include myself in this, we can be wrong. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to speak the truth. It doesn't mean we should, you know, be hesitant about that. Um, it means we should, when we do speak the truth, we should do so with kindness. And um, from the teacher part, he pushes that contrast of selfish ambition and gentleness. Selfish ambition, um, selfishness, jealousy is the source of so much that we say. We use words to build ourselves up over others. And that's the way knowledge works, right? You've heard the phrase, knowledge is power. That reflects our society's idea that the more you know, um, the higher you get, right? And people can be very contemptuous of those with less education. But wisdom doesn't do that. Wisdom doesn't put one person above another. And the wiser you get, the more you'll know what you don't know. And the more you'll know that what you do have is a gift. Right? James says, if you're speaking out of selfish ambition, it's, it's not from God. If it's all about building yourself up, it's not from God. And he, um, he builds with three words. It's earthly. It comes from this world. It's unspiritual, doesn't come from God's spirit, and demonic. He's not saying it, you know, you're speaking from Satan. He's saying the origin of selfishness is evil. When we speak from our own ambitions, our own fears, our own insecurities, our own hates, our own um, seeking our own power it comes from a place of evil but that contrasts with the wisdom that comes from above you can work really hard and become an expert at anything none of us can be wise on our own. We can only be wise, we can only know God's path with help from God. And honestly, with help from one another. All of us make many mistakes and we actually need each other to gently correct us. Wisdom is always a gift. And if you've received a gift, that means you're not 
you know, better than others. There's a, a beautiful quote from D.T. Niles that's actually uh, used in our statement of faith, living faith, that um, Christianity is, or sharing Christianity, is one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. We know God's love for us. We know God's plans for us. We know God's faithfulness to us as a gift. We didn't earn it. And that means when we speak, if we know something from the Lord, it's not about us. It's a gift from God. We do live in an age of increasing fear and anger. And so I believe that as a church together, we are called to do something very countercultural, to speak God's truth in a way that's gentle, in a way that's kind, in a way that shows that, that we've received a gift that could be for everyone. Um, sometimes signs that have scripture on them on the side of the highway uh, seem really aggressive. I don't, I don't know if you find that, but you know, beautiful, true signs, but do you have Jesus in your life? Or Jesus is the way they come across as harsh. But I, I remember seeing uh, on the wall in a little Mennonite market, uh, a little ways north of here, the verse, Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. It's not putting yourself above anyone. It's speaking the truth with love. And so I think we're called today to show a gentleness that's transformative. Here uh, in Canada, we're in the middle of a uh, federal election. And uh, there are lots of little digs going around um, and lots of use of fear and shame to persuade people of one side or the other. I would encourage you to uh, vote as a Christian, to use your faith, to use your trust in God to decide how you vote. And use your faith as a Christian to campaign if you feel called to, to seek to persuade others. And know that someone else is using their faith as a Christian genuinely to vote for someone else. I, I can think of uh, very good reasons to vote for or not vote for pretty much every one of the parties that's an option. I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm saying I believe we're called to speak differently about such a big thing. To listen, not pretend to listen, but genuinely listen to people that have a different view from us. And to tell the truth that God has given us um, with kindness, trusting that we can be wrong. I believe we're called to speak this way in the classrooms that you're about to go into on Tuesday. To be the kid that, um, that builds bridges between different cliques, that, that connects uh, people that don't get along, that doesn't you know, try to be on top, but tries to make peace between everyone. We're called to do that in our workplaces, in our families, we're called to speak in a way that plants peace. I'll come back to those two images from the beginning to end this message. The tongue, what we say, is a spark that starts a forest fire lit from hell itself. 
and peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. A few small words can make a massive difference. And uh, the thing about those two images is they happen at different paces, right? Um, if you flick a match into a dry forest, it will go up fast and the effects of a forest fire can be seen um, immediately and hugely and dramatically. Damage is easy to notice. But seeds, and maybe especially these metaphorical seeds of peace, take time. They take care. And we've all had that moment where we blurted out something uh, that we shouldn't have and see the damage right away. But you have also spoken words of God's peace into someone's life and done good, done a kindness, made a difference, and it doesn't show as fast. But those seeds are growing. So I think we're called to plant more, to trust that we belong to God enough to be safe and speak gently out of that safety into a world that desperately, desperately needs it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you first and most for uh, your living word to us, Jesus Christ. Thank you that in him all your fullness uh, live, that in him uh, we can know you, Heavenly Father. Help us to be imitators of Jesus. We thank you for your word given to us in uh, the scriptures, in these gospels and letters and prophecies and poetry and song um, that teach us who you are, that guide our lives. Thank you for the scripture and may we get to know it better. We thank you for your words of power that you speak um, today through your people. We thank you for people that have um, <clears throat> spoken to us kindly, who've called us out when we needed it, who've encouraged us when we were down, who've led us into knowing you better. God, thank you for your word. And we pray that um, your word, your way, your wisdom, your peace will grow in our world. We pray it'll grow in our own lives. We name to you people we love that need that peace to grow in them. We pray for your peace in our city. Lord, we pray for a, a revival, a renewal in Sarnia. We pray that people will fall more and more in love with you here. And that, that will um, help people to have homes and food and kindness and belonging. Lord, we pray that your peace will grow in our world. That you will teach us through the, this time of strife of your kindness and love. Thank you that uh, we do not pray on our own that even when our words are not correct, your Holy Spirit prays for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey